home. And so Bitcoin is attempting to break to the upside of a symmetrical triangle pattern. This, if it plays out, would be a huge reversal pattern from a continuation pattern. If you want to understand what that means and exactly what my next trade is, make sure you hit up the like button. Don't forget to subscribe. Watch through to the very end as we're going to show you this exact Bitcoin pattern that is playing out right now that could give us an explosive move to the upside. Now, please keep in mind, you guys know I continue to have a longer term bearish stance and it makes complete sense, right? I'm sitting here on the hourly chart and you can see we entered this symmetrical pattern in the bearish trend, okay? So this was a bearish trend going into a symmetrical triangle. A symmetrical triangle is a continuation pattern, as I've mentioned many times, which give you a higher probability of breaking to the downside. Now, that doesn't mean that the smaller probability scenario of breaking to the upside cannot happen. And I'm going to show you exactly what that could look like. Now, if we zoom in here, you can see what happened. The other day, we had our little run up from 19,000 up to about 20 and a half, where everybody get exci got excited and put their leverage long positions. And then you saw the typical move happened where the market was dumped and taken you back down to the downside. And that was perfectly normal within the structure of our symmetrical triangle. This is a really beautiful symmetrical triangle and it's the, the upper resistance and the bottom support is being respected quite a lot here. You can see how we then just bounce back down and then the bull step back in a bit higher, creating a higher high, trying to push us now through the upper bound. You can see you had that fake breakout here. So the bears held on just about here. You saw this fake breakout and a bunch of people got liquidated there. So be very, very careful of taking any trade too early. And then what you saw was an important bounce here from the 200 EMA on the hourly chart. Now, this is a good sign here because as you can see on this, on this mini uptrend within the triangle, Bitcoin has over the last had for of hourly candles managed to create higher highs higher lows and a higher high which is really good so now the question is do we get that next higher high which would take us out of the wedge and that is what we want to look out for and if we do get that you guys will be able to trade this i will be taking this trade on bybit and bitget links in the description because if we get a nice confirmation of this break you'd want to wait for a candle confirmation to enter the trade but then also i would wait for the retest and once we bounce back i'd increase my position even further now, where would I be looking to ride this position to? Well, if we do get the breakout, I'd want to be getting my first take profit at about this first pivot point here. And this pivot point sits at about 21,800. So I'd be taking a little bit off the table there. I'd be taking a little bit at the next pivot point at about 23. Uh, and then I'd start taking profits on the way up if we started to fill this gap from this brick big breakdown to the downside. Now, if I bring out the VPVR as well, you will see we're in the hugely contested area. You can see from there, that we're in a high volume profile area, but we'll also be running into volume between about 20,000 and 21 and a half. So you want to take this area uh, quite cautiously between those levels, and then you can get more confident once we break above 21 and a half here on this trade. Okay. Now I need to make you guys aware that it's not just the upward scenario that can happen. The, the, the bias is still to the downside. So I'm giving you the scenario of what would happen if we do manage to break to the upside. And it'll be clear because we break the up uh, the upper resistance, the yellow line. But if we break to the downside, this is what we need to be aware of. Let's get back to the hourly chart. And this is what I'd be looking out for. So you can see here, if I head over to the five minute chart, I've drawn us a little thin uh, upwards sloping uh, support line. Okay, so you can see here we're at respecting this upward support. We're trying to work to the bigger pattern to break out to the outside. Now, if we lose this, if we lose this line here, if we lose this line and do something like this, then we could be heading back down to the bottom of the channel, back towards 19,200, 19,300, those kind of levels. Okay, because then we're back in our normal triangle. So you need to watch for that trend on the five minute, 10 minute chart to see are we going to get that breakout? And if so, enter a little position, wait for a retest, and you can load up, or I will be waiting to see okay are we just going to head back to the downside now if we head back to the downside on the wedge then again the lower price targets start to open themselves up again but again we have to be cautious of if we lose the downward support of the yellow line okay so we're in this symmetrical triangle the bias is to the downside but where the price is sat right now is close to a breakout so you want to see do we get the breakout of trend do we have volume that's going to be very very important is look for the volume candlesticks let me show you Let's just lift that up here. You want to see volume coming in. So you want to see good volume candles on your chart when you get that breakout. If you don't, 
then that could be a red flag that you're getting another fake out. So I want you guys to take a careful look at the volume candles and make sure that when we get the breakout, you're getting volume. You can see from this previous fake out, which we had, there was not significant volume in this candle here. When you had this candle here, you can see the volume here was not significant, right? We've seen higher volume candles in the recent four hour candles before then. So it didn't show that it was a clear breakout. And that could have been your red flag to say, I'm not entering this trade just yet. You should also wait for confirmation, wait for a close above this trend line and enter on the next green candle after that. I know that takes a little bit longer to enter the position, that's what's called confirmation. You've waited for confirmation that you've closed a candle above uh, the support line before entering the position. Okay, let's take a quick look at Fear and Greed Index sitting at 18. And this makes sense now. As the market starts to sit at around 20,000 for longer and longer, the fear starts to dissipate from the market, right? If a, if a price of Bitcoin, when it first was falling all the way down to 19 and went lower than its previous bull market high, a lot of fear enters the market. It's the, it's the decline that makes people scary. Think of a roller coaster. As you're falling, that's the scare. That's the fear in the market. That's when everybody's paying for it. You can get some really, really crazy prices. But then as the roller coaster starts to level off, even though you're in that same ditch, right? It's just you don't have that same uh, acceleration down and therefore the fear starts to call off, okay? So people are becoming more accustomed to a 19,000, 20,000 Bitcoin than they were just a couple of months ago. So that's very, very important to understand in the market, okay? If we also take a look at the US markets, we've got a little bit of green. I'd say it's flat, a little bit of, it's flat here on the pre-market. Dow futures flat. Yep, S&P flat and the NASDAQ flat. We we'll have to keep an eye on what happens here in the market today. We've got the FOMC minutes. Very, very important. Again, I, I hate how this happens, right? You get the FOMC minutes one whole month after the FOMC meeting, right? So we covered the FOMC meeting live here. And then you have to wait a full month before this PDF document comes out explaining what they discussed. And it's annoying because the markets actually take it seriously. They read for it and they look to see if the Fed were hawkish in any manner and the markets can move based on it. So please be careful. If you're taking any trades with me on Bybit or BitGet, you're doing so looking at the macro economy. That's what this channel is about. Taking careful, pragmatic uh, risks, but also doing so with the full data set, using your technical analysis, using your macroeconomics, using your fundamentals, letting them align and then taking your trades. So if you're following these YouTubers who just say, oh my God, this is the trade to take, click the link in the description, a thousand times leverage and, you, and you're good to go. No, that's not how you trade. You trade with a sensible portion of your portfolio. Do not risk more than 1% of your portfolio. Make sure you've got tight stop losses. Make sure you got take profits. Do not use leverage right? Make sure everything marries up and you're good to go. That's how you trade here in this market. <clears throat> okay, so a few interesting updates I want to give you guys, so make sure you stay tuned. What I've got for you here first is Voyager now seeks bankruptcy. They followed the footsteps of 3 Arrows Capital and they've now declared Chapter 11 bankruptcy late yesterday night in New York. Now, they're saying that there should be some funds available for clients but at the same time, they're saying they've got one to ten billion dollars in assets and about one to ten billion in liabilities. Like, is it one billion or is it ten? Like, what a huge range. They don't really know what they've got. Uh, so that's going to have to play out to see whether any money is available. But they said funds will be available for distribution to unsecured creditors. OK, so that's very, very important. But here's the crazy thing, right, with this whole Voyager situation. I made a full video breakdown where I go ahead and rant about that over here and explain exactly what happened. But in essence, they had 60 percent of their exposure to three hours capital. So their, their, their CEO, Stephen Echlik, I can't pronounce his name there. It's right there. Stephen Echlik, he, he came out and said, look, he started to trying to blame Three Hours Capital. And obviously I'd feel his pain as well, but why don't he look in the mirror? 60% of all his loan exposure was to one crypto hedge fund. And trust me, guys, this doesn't happen by accident. I want to find out what was going on. If anybody knows what was going on, what's laying underneath there that he gave Free Hours Capital such huge exposure. Because even for a DJ, even for a useless CEO, you would not have 60% of your book tied into one hedge fund. What was going on there? What was the quid pro quo? I would love to know what was going on behind the scenes between Voyager and Three Hours Capital. Because that risk management seems horrible. Not just seems horrible, it is horrible. 60%. For a, for a public listed company, that is absolutely insane. Now, the other thing to make sure we understand is a lot of people were saying that Voyager was FDIC insured. This is very important for you American users out there. They were saying this is FDI insured, FDIC insured, and they had that in their marketing materials, right? That your deposits are protected up to 250K. Now, very important to understand. This is important. FDIC insurance is for bank held fiat deposits. 
Okay, now Voyager doesn't do the banking for themselves. Their banking is done by a bank called Metropolitan Commercial Bank. Very important. Now, Metropolitan Commercial Bank did not have a bank failure. Therefore, FDIC insurance does not kick in. This was a Voyager failure. A Voyager failure does not kick in. Also, even if your money was in stable coins, it doesn't kick in either. So two reasons why it wouldn't have kicked in. One, you were in stable coins. Two, the bank didn't fail. Metropolitan Commercial Bank didn't fail. Voyager failed. FDIC insurance doesn't sit with Voyager. It sits with the bank. Very, very important. Do not get confused by any of the marketing material being offered by any of these centralized finance lenders. Speaking of which... Celsius repays 183 million on DeFi exchange. So they've gone ahead on Maker and they've paid off another 183 million dollars in loan, bringing the liquidation price down now to I think about two thousand dollars on Bitcoin. And a lot of people are now getting excited about what this could mean for getting their money back. And I guess there's a few things. One, it's good that they're making progress, right? It seems like they've sat down there and they've tried to figure out a game plan with their various traditional finance advisors who will be taking a crazy cut of customers' money, by the way. These financial advisors don't work for free, right? Celsius goes and, you know, uh, uh, goes and uh, instructs a whole bunch of investment banks to help them with their restructuring. How do you think they get paid? <laughs> do, you, do you think they work for free? They, they get paid off your funds, right? Which you're not going to get. So $183 million of collateralized, uh, they, they went ahead and paid down 183 million and the reason they did this was remember these are over collateralized this is DeFi. DeFi is good because it's over collateralized not like the loan celsius uh provides out right so this is this is uh over collateralized which means if they pay it off they pay the debt off they'll get more money back because they posted all that collateral um so they want that cash back out and uh what they currently got was they got 2000 wrap bitcoin back worth about 40 million so far but if they keep paying off the 41 million dollars they owe which is about 41 million die the stable coin they could then get back their 22,000 wrapped bitcoin okay so you can take a look at the exchanges that they've gone ahead and done they were paying back all of these debt amounts here and then they took back the 2000 in wrapped bitcoin uh, over the since july the first okay so that's over the last kind of five or six days here Okay, now let's keep things moving. I want to show you a few interesting charts very quickly, which I've seen on the on-chain metrics before wrapping this up. And what I want to show you is that there's now a divergence between withdrawals and deposits for the first time in history. It's the first time this has happened. Okay, now normally, if you look at the pink line and the green line, the pink line are your deposits on all exchanges. Your green line are your withdrawals on all exchanges. And as you can see, these move nicely with price, right? When the price goes up, more people are interested in Bitcoin coin more people are depositing and more people withdrawing because people are taking profits as well so you get this nice harmony between these graphs now the green line is always less than the pink line because of exchanges and how they operate exchanges always bundled together withdrawals you may have seen this before they bundled together withdrawals for more efficient transactions uh, so they can process a handful of withdrawals in one transaction so that's why you always see the line the green line slightly below the pink line but what we're seeing is a, it is a, a big uh, divergence going on where the two lines are now starting to try to head towards each other and again the first time this has happened in crypto history and what does this mean this is because of the mass own your keys revolution, right? Everybody is now talking about, including myself, take your keys off crypto, get off these centralized exchanges and hold your crypto through this bear market on a software wallet or a hardware wallet. Take it off the exchanges. And we're seeing that start to happen now. We're seeing this divergence start to happen as people take responsibility for their coins. Now, why is it good? Why is it good to see exchange volumes fall like this? As you can see, uh, exchange balance has declined to 2.4 million Bitcoin. The last time it was this low was 2018 in July from a peak of 3.15. So this has fallen quite heavily here on uh, Bitcoin. But why is this a good thing? This is a good thing because if people are holding their own coins and taking their own responsibility, they are ves very less likely to panic sell. If you've got your keys on a on a uh, on a long term thesis, you've taken it out, you've put it into cold storage, you know why you bought it, you're not selling it for ten years. Then when the price suddenly moves over a quick hour candle, you're not going to panic yourself and say, "Oh, I need to sell, I need to sell." You remind yourself of the long term conviction, and that's good longer term for us to recover here on the Bitcoin price. So we're seeing that start to fall here to the downside. Also taking a look at the net position change monthly. This is the record month we've seen on outflows. One hundred fifty. 51,000 monthly position change, the largest outflow on record, again, caused by the collapse of CFI lenders, whether it's Celsius, whether it's BlockFi, whether it's Vault Finance, whether it's Babel Finance, all of these guys, you can see it's a real struggle time for centralized finance and people are now taking responsibility, rightfully so, into their own hands, withdrawing and holding their own keys. 
And last but not least, I did want to share this with you, which is the behavior of people who are accumulating. And what I wanted to share with you guys specifically here is I wanted to share uh, the accumulation. And what you can see just here on the right hand side, the dark blue is a perfect score of one. In other words, these cohorts are accumulating. So the key thing to show you here is if you look at the two cohorts which are accumulating heavy, and we've seen this over the last couple of weeks now, it's the whales, those with more than 10k Bitcoin, they're accumulating heavy. This is really dark blue here. And if you look at the shrimps, those with less than one Bitcoin, they're accumulating heavy. And the middle ground, those with one Bitcoin all the way to 10 Bitcoin, are sat in the middle. Now, what is the rationale behind this? Why would this happen? Well, it makes complete sense if you think about it. Those with less than one Bitcoin, what a perfect time to be in crypto, right? You enter crypto, crypto sitting at the prices last seen four or five years ago, less than the previous bull market high. And you're like, wow, I'm so lucky. I found crypto four or five years late, but I can get it at the same price. You got nothing to lose. You start to dollar cost averaging and you build out your position trying to get to one Bitcoin. And we're seeing more and more people now able to get to holding one, two, three Bitcoin. Whereas in the previous bull run last year, nobody was able to get to one Bitcoin, right? It took $64,000 to get to one Bitcoin, which you can get three and a quarter of now. Okay. Also the whales, the whales have been there, seen, they've done this before. They do not get frightened by the bear markets. They're moving huge amounts of uh, institutional capital, experienced capital. They know what they're doing. They've made money in crypto before, and they've seen these cycles before. So for them, going ahead and buying the dip and accumulating is not an issue for them. This is when they want to do their accumulation. Now, the ones in between, those are the ones you want to keep an eye on. Those are the ones between one Bitcoin and 10K Bitcoin. Now, there's a few types of people in here. These are the types of people who have made enough money in Bitcoin that they're scared. Right? Maybe they did just a, the pre, before the previous bull run. Maybe they just bought one or two or three Bitcoin and it's grown to this amount, right? As, as in a little bit of a dollar value, sorry. And it's grown to an impressive amount. But as you can see, now they're feeling the pinch. Now they're worried. They don't have enough cash or conviction to dollar cost average. But at the same time, they're not really selling as well. They're just, they're feeling the pinch. Those are the ones in the middle where they're not quite whales, but they're sitting on a serious amount of money that they're feeling it. They've realized loss is now quite high. They've probably not seen something like this and it's affecting them. And therefore, it's not giving them the confidence to go and buy more. Okay, so that's really, really important for what we're seeing. Now, very, very important that we also take a quick look here at the dollar index because this is the antithesis to Bitcoin, right? We know the dollar, cost, the, the dollar index. Let me just pull this up. Here we go. The DXY. This moves in opposition to Bitcoin. It's inversely correlated. And you can see this just continues, continues to climb another strong day opening up here today on the 6th of July. Another green candle here on the Dixie. And if I should zoom out to the weekly candle, what I do want to show you guys is look at the behavior of this. Now, if you look at the way I've labeled the first rejection and second rejection, these both indicated times when Bitcoin decided to go on its run. So you can see here, December 16, uh, you got the peak here on the dollar index. You then see here, April 20, at the COVID time, you see a peak on the dollar index. After both these retracements, Bitcoin went soaring. And the question is, when do we get our next peak to the downside? We were hoping for some resistance along this line, but you can see how dollar index just broke straight through it. It just was not bothered by it, and it's showing good, good strength. Now, is this dollar strength? How could this be dollar strength? A lot of you guys are asking because, you know, the, the can't be dollar strength because the they're printing so much dollars. It's huge inflation. What's going on? Well, the reality is the dollar is seen as the safe asset. So if you think the dollar is struggling, it is, but it's just the best of a bad bunch. Where else are you going to put your money right now? Are you going to put it in another currency? No. So this is just a reflection of sentiment. And the reflection of sentiment right now is we're heading to a global recession. Things are tough out there. Russia, Ukraine wars, issues with commodity prices. People continue to still flock to the dollar, right? If you're in a third world country, are you going to trust your Venezuelan uh, currency? Are you going to trust the Argentine? Argentinian currency? Are you going to trust the Sri Lankan currency? No, right? You're still going to rotate across the dollars. And that's why we're seeing such strength here from the dollar index. And until this cools off, uh, we won't see a huge run on Bitcoin. And again, this won't cool off until risk starts to come on. We start to see some green shoots of recovery in the economy. We start to see comments from Jerome Powell talking about potentially pausing rate hikes. Then we can start to see things starting to improve from here. Now, the final thing to look at is the quantitative tightening process. Remember, the Fed committed to quantitative tightening. They said that they would reduce the balance sheet of the Feds 
by 30 billion in just treasuries every single month and about 17.5 billion in mortgage-backed securities each month. So call it 45 billion roughly uh, every single month starting from the 1st of June. Now, what have we actually seen? Well, it's, the QT has been very, very sluggish straight away uh, from the first month it started. So what you can actually see is mortgage-backed securities actually rose. They actually increased by almost 2 billion the number of uh, mortgage-backed securities they've purchased when this was supposed to fall by 17.5 billion in this month and they only managed to reduce their treasuries which is supposed to fall by 30 billion they've dropped this by 10 billion in one month so quantitative tightening is not having an effect and now the question is going to be Will this catch up or will the Fed say, no, we need to slow down our QT because of the extenuating circumstances, because of the markets, because of commodity pricing, because of the war? And if that's the case, the market's already priced in the $45 billion a month. So that could be a catalyst for us to get a brief relief rally if we notice that the Fed is not sticking to their $45 billion of uh, quantitative tightening each month. So we're going to have to find out what happens in July. Do they catch up? Does it start to ramp up? Or are they going to come out and say, oh, we're going to keep doing it at this sluggish pace, in which case markets will have to unwind the 45 billion that they priced into the market, which could give us a bit of green. A lot to cover off in this video. I hope you guys enjoy the type of content. Smash up the like button and subscribe if you appreciate this type of content. Let me know in the comments. If you're going to take that trade with me, please be very, very careful, but you can use BitGet and Bybit. Links in the description to some amazing bonuses with both of those platforms. With Bybit, we will be giving away an iPad when we get to 10,000 subscribers. Not far away right now. You will need to be signed up with my link below. With BitGet, we are giving random airdrops away in our Discord. So head into our Discord, ejars.uk forward slash Discord. Literally just jump in there. And occasionally, I'll just jump in and say, drop your Bybit, uh, BitGet ID, and we give out free funds in there. So definitely get involved with that. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Smash the like button and subscribe. Go watch this video, and I'll see you in the next one.